Welcome, everybody, to episode 96 of Radicalized Truth Survives. I'm Heidi Kuda, and today Hi-Fi and I are interviewing our friend Paul Nyland. He's a Kiev-based reporter who also is the founder of the nation's first suicide uh, hotline, Lifeline Ukraine. He's going to explain to us why he believes that Russia is a death cult. Have a listen. Paul Nyland, we are so happy to have you back with us today. As our viewers know, because they've met you before, you uh, report on the war that's happening currently in Ukraine. You are based in Kiev, and you also founded the very important uh, national suicide hotline in Ukraine, Lifeline Ukraine. And before we talk about that, I want to kind of jump into what's happening militarily in Ukraine, because I don't think we get the proper boots on the ground reporting in America. We don't get it enough. And give us kind of an update on what we should know about, uh, you know, how things look. And when I talk to you, I don't even think we understand um, some of the battles that have occurred recently in the last, you know, few months, really. Okay, so firstly, uh, I thank you for inviting me back. It's it's been a while. It's it's maybe a year, I think, since the the last time I was on your podcast. But um, yeah, the 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 situation on the ground um, needs to be understood from various different perspectives. Um, we we see the media talking about Russian gains, Russian advances, um, but the the fact is is that it, they are ever diminishing gains, right? So. If, if we look back at, at Bakhmut, Bakhmut was a was a city of seventy three thousand people, right? The, the the most recent place to fall was Avdiivka, which was a, a city of thirty two thousand people. And and what's next in their sights? And this is Putin's big goal for 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 Victory Day, right? For for May the ninth, is is a place called Chasiv Yar. It's got twelve thousand five hundred people. Or it had twelve thousand five hundred people. From from what I read now, there's 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 six hundred and forty eight residents of that um, settlement that have that have stayed behind, mostly elderly. They don't want to leave. This is their home, and we we see this repeated time and time again. But you know, Russia's ability to be able to take territory anywhere in Ukraine is it, 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 it it's it's almost nothing, right, compared to what happened in the initial blitzkrieg stage of the full-scale invasion where they took these big swathes of territory, they took the, the land bridge to, to Crimea. They're, they're incapable of doing that now. And I wrote a piece, and one thing that you and I share, Heidi, is that we both write for, for Byline Times. I, I wrote a piece at the time that it was clear that the, 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 the defense of Bakhmut was, was, was no longer uh, something that, that, that was offering a return on investment to the Ukrainian forces, right? And, and so they were going to abandon it. And I wrote that this is this is Russia's culmination. And and it wasn't even the Russian army, once considered to be the second strongest army in the world, that was the primary force driving to take Bakhmut. It was it was Wagner. It was Yevgeny Prigozhin's mercenaries and, and convicts that he'd you know, busted out of prison because Putin was promising them a pardon. And, you know, I, 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 I'm proud of that piece about Bakhmut. And it's it's proven to be true because of Dievka, now Chasiv Yar, like, I mean, the, the, their advances are nominal and, and they're coming at a huge cost, a massive cost. T today was the first day in a full week that the number of Russian losses on the front it was less than, less than 1,000. For the six days prior, Every single day, the number of Russian combat fatalities was over a thousand. It was one thousand two hundred and sixty, one thousand three hundred and fifty. I mean, it just it went on and on and on. And you know, from our perspective, those of us sitting here in Ukraine, we we could cheer about those numbers. The, the, there's large numbers of, of of the occupiers who, who are getting taken out of the the battle. The other side to that is that th those high casualty rates mean that. The, 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 there's a lot of attacks going on. There's a lot of action on the front line. And that, that also translates, sadly, to our brave Ukrainian uh, men and women of the Ukrainian armed forces uh, also, you know, taking losses as well at the same time. But but Russia is Russia is done. Russia, Russia is busted militarily. Oh, I'm just like. 
this is just, this is really good news. It's not what we hear. We are always continually flooded with the propaganda. I've got multiple questions, but Hi-Fi, you go. So right now, the, the UK Ministry of Defense estimates that there are over 460,000 Russians who have uh, died in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. right? um, what do you think has changed with the Russian people that they have this appetite for the slaughter of their citizens, because I think back to Afghanistan and they hit, you know, a hundred thousand and people in Russia were freaked. Mm -hmm. And now three, four times that in Ukraine, but it's okay to the Russian people. Is it just the brainwashing of the Russian government? What, what is Okay, so so the Afghanistan comparison uh, is very interesting because that was that was a conflict that the Soviet Union were involved in for a decade, a decade of war, and they saw a fraction of the the casualties that 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 they've seen here in in just a little over two years in Ukraine. Um, I, I saw this report from the UK Defence Ministry as well, and it was four hundred and sixty five thousand dead and wounded, not just dead. Um, okay. But in 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 a in a in in a Western expectation, we we would expect to see the killed in action to wounded in action ratio to be one to six, one to seven, something like that. But with but with the Russians, it's it's probably like one to one, right? Because they they don't do medivac; they they're not taking people off the battlefield who might actually have a chance at surviving if they were to get if they were to get medical care and they haven't been doing that since since day one i mean it's 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 even worse than that it's not just leaving people to bleed out on the battlefield anybody who's retreating is shot by the russian side they 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 they're shot by these barrier troops which has been a age old russian stroke soviet tactic as well to 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 motivate people i, I suppose is the best way that we describe it but Russia, Russia has become, and it is exactly as you you put it in your question, Hi-Fi, um, a, a, a result of propaganda. Russia has become a death cult. The 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 way that the supposed heroism of fighting and dying for your country is is portrayed in Russia it, it is is, I mean, it's it's become a fundamental part of their national identity. And one of the things that leads to that has been this militarization of society that we've seen. I mean, it's 10 years since Ukraine has been at war with Russia, right? It's it's 10 years since the the first Russian invasion of Crimea and, and the Donbass and the hot war that they started in Donbass that cost many, many thousands of casualties on on the Ukrainian side. I, I, I remember writing uh, back, in the, back in the day when I used to contribute a lot for the Kiev Post. I, I wrote an article called uh, The Kremlin's Dirty Secret, Gruz Dvisti, the, the, the Cargo 200. And, and Cargo 200 is the, the, the military uh, uh, signifier for a, a, a dead body, right? And, and I wrote an article about how Russia was covering this up. And, and this was, I don't know, seven years ago, something like that, seven, maybe eight years ago. And the, the, the closure of the St. Petersburg uh, soldiers' mothers uh, group, the, the, the harassment of journalists that were trying to go to the, 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 the cemetery in, in Peskov to look at the freshly dug graves and, and so on there. Because at that time, obviously, Russia was denying that they were involved in, in, in the war in the Donbass, which was just as usual for Russia. It, it, it was a lie. But, but over this period, yeah, the, 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 the propaganda... The domestic propaganda that, that the Kremlin churns out has 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 done this. It is it has turned this country, it, I mean, into a fascist state. I've, I've written about that for Byline Times as well. The definition of fascism and how Russia meets all of those criteria. It it is it is a fascist state. It's also a, it's also a death cult, and it, I mean it's it's a place where people are indoctrinated. Um, through propaganda into believing the lies about the reason for this war. I, I watched a documentary by Deutsche Welte uh, yesterday on the, 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 the indoctrination of the people. And in the, in the closing 
minutes, there was a an older woman. I think she was like eighty six years old or something like that. And and when she was asked certain questions, and and she was like, "So why are we fighting this war?" and and her response would be, "Well, it's against the Nazis." And when she got the answer out, which is what she's programmed to say, she then laughed, like she knows it's bullshit. She she knows it's a lie. And there was another example that came shortly after that as well. I think it was about liberating territory, right? No, nothing's being liberated. It's 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 being obliterated. But but again, she did the same thing after she came out with her answer, parroting the propaganda from state media. She laughed. They 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 know what they're doing. And and again, that is a contributing factor to why Russia is a, a fascist state because of because of the mindset that they have developed there amongst the overwhelming yes. majority of the population. So one of our former guests, Volodymyr Demchenko, he uh-huh. said for this war to end, he said that Russia needs to stop existing as a nation state. Would you agree with that? I mean, given what we're seeing, given how the Russian government has turned their people into this cult, is it time for a dismantling of Russia? So I... I I, I disagree with the sequencing, but I, I agree generally with the principle. I, what, what is going to happen, I believe, after Russia's defeat, is that the current Russian Federation is, is going to splinter into various different constituent parts. Um, the, the, there's areas of, of minorities that have been just devastated by their losses. I mean, we, we, we see so many casualties, for example, from Buryatia. And, and, you know, the huge, huge numbers, massive percentages of, of their local populations ha- have, have been sent to be slaughtered in, in Ukraine. And uh, I, I believe those kind of um, examples of these uh, regional uh, areas that, 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 that have a claim to some degree of, of independence, I, I, I think that's what's going to trigger the splintering of, of Russia. But the catalyst will be Russia's defeat in Ukraine. Yes, right. And and then it will be the local demands of of the people of those regions for, for, for them to secede from the Russian Federation itself. But I mean, all this will follow yes. the end of the Putin regime and the... the Absolutely. The current, the, it, ha- the current it, it has to be the end. Circle, yeah. It has to be the end of the Putin regime. As you've been talking, I've been thinking about how it should be absolutely wildly illegal to uh, participate in these types of mind hacking operations. And essentially, calling Russia a death cult is so perfect. We interviewed Dr. Ian Garner, who explained how they indoctrinate the children. He wrote Z Generation into the parts of Russia's fascist youth. And it shows how they are absolutely breeding this type of fascism into their children. And you explained it so incredibly beautifully that it must be something uh, that is defeated. And that starts with Ukraine defeating Russia. And that starts with then Putin's regime absolutely being annihilated and dismantled. And yes, this, this decrepit empire must be splintered off. I don't see any other way out. So thank you, both of you, for that um, incredibly thoughtful conversation. And as we talk about propaganda, Paul, I know you pay attention to what you're seeing in America and seeing this type of death cult speak, you know, bleeding its way into America. And what are your observations? Because we write a lot about the propagandists and, uh, and it's just, they're not hiding it anymore. The people like Tucker Carlson, Alex Jones, Mike Flynn, they don't, they, they don't cloak it anymore. They're full on, you know, you know, Tucker Carlson, Alex Jones, full on platforming Alexander Dugan. And uh, when you see that, what, what would you like to tell the American people? Well, first, first of all, I, I thought it was absolutely hilarious that uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene's stunt with this mugger hat, this make Ukraine great again thing that she did at this, this press conference has totally backfired on her and everyone's gone, that's brilliant. Where do I get those hats? And people are starting to manufacture them now. So, it's it, yeah, that's, that, that's cool. But, I mean, I, I, Alex Jones and Tucker Carlson, right? So I, I saw a piece yesterday... Tucker Carlson was on Josh Rogan's show and he was he was lauding Alex Jones as some kind of prophet 
who's who's getting like you know divine um uh inspiration and insight to be able to say such profound and 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 deep uh you know prophetic things why it's, didn't he see himself losing a billion dollars in a court case you just you just made exactly the point that i was going to make hi <laughs> fi thank you yeah i i the, the guy owes a billion dollars for lying about what happened and 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 being a a, a monster to the families of of, of of children who were slaughtered in sandy hook like that's that's who alex jones is Tucker Carlson, you know, I mean, going to Moscow to interview Vladimir Putin is bad enough, right? But then that he would give a platform to that fascist Alexander Dugin as well, as as though, you know, he's a, he's a guy whose ideas, he's a philosopher, they deserve, you know, some kind of hearing. No, the man is a fascist. That's what he is. Alexander Dugin has called the people of Ukraine cockroaches and said that we should be exterminated. That's all I was going to add. Genocidal fascist. Like he's he's called for the genocide of Ukrainian people. And, so, and for, the, for new viewers who haven't tuned in yet, they should know that Alexander Dugin actually created the National Bolshevik Party in Russia. And that was Nazi Bolsheviks, Nazbol. Right. That's who Dugan is. Yeah. And and uh, with regard to genocide, that's a really, really important word. And it, it, it's a very important point to cover again for for uh, Byline Times. I wrote an article and I, I, I took the definition of genocide and, and I wanted to explain how what Russia is doing in Ukraine and to Ukraine uh, qualifies as, as as genocide. So I took the 1948 United Nations Convention on genocide, and and there are there are five criteria, and uh, to to qualify as uh, uh, committing an act of genocide, you you need to be doing one of the five, and Russia is actually doing all five of yeah. them. Yeah, all five of them, and I've I've explained it in great detail. And the funny thing was with that actually was I, I I'd written the article, and I often. When I, when I write something, I'll, I'll put it to bed and then I'll come back the next day, look at it with fresh eyes, do a little edit, add in some you know hyperlinks of supporting evidence and, and everything else. And in that that period between writing and, and, and returning to it, Medvedev, Dmitry Medvedev, the one-time pretend president of Russia, who was just a, a placeholder, puppet. obviously, for four yeah. years, the, the puppet, yeah, and, and fellow criminal of yeah. the St. Petersburg uh, uh, era with, 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 with yeah. Putin, um, Medvedev went on one of his regular rants, um, and and it, it created the perfect new opening paragraph to the article that I had just written because it because we were able to say like you know not only is Russia committing genocide in Ukraine, but here is the latest statement hours ago, fresh from Dmitry Medvedev, doing exactly that, calling for genocidal actions. And yes. there's a there's a there's a, a, a quote. I think it's about six months old, and one of the best experts in North America on on the far right on on history is is Professor Tim Snyder from from Yale, and and he was asked in an interview maybe six months ago, why won't the leaders of Western countries call what is happening to Ukraine a genocide? And Snyder simply said, he said because if they recognize it as such, they are obligated to do something about it. Yeah. It's so funny that you bring that up because I've been binging hours and hours of Timothy Snyder, both for my soul, because mm -hmm. I need to hear his words and also for the education I receive. And he did exactly what you're describing in one of his talks where he went through the various definitions. And I was listening to it going, yep, checks that list. Yep, checks that list. Yep. You know, it's like and 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 how you just framed it was absolutely um vitally important. Uh, we have no inoculation in America against um, propaganda. And, and it's a shitty word for what it is, which is really uh, forcing people to live in a false reality. Yeah. And if you could, from Ukraine, in the country that is defending the post-World War II democratic way of life, wake Americans up to what is happening to their minds, the divisiveness, 
the Tatushki mobs, everything that you've already seen in Ukraine in the last decade happening here. What are some of the things that you could really just just help alert people to the fact that they are, you know, giving their uh, reality away? And I have a friend from Russia who says that people walk around not even knowing what reality is anymore. Uh, that that final quote is is quite interesting, and you know one of, one of the purposes of uh, disinformation is is not to necessarily convince you that something is true. It is to make you doubt the whole idea of of an objective truth, and and um, th this is something that that people are sadly successfully manipulating and um if, if i were to give a piece of advice what what's the name of this woman who's trump's potential vp who who shot her puppy Chris, christy no the governor right. of south dakota we we on the rad pod team believe that that was her audition tape to show she was cruel enough for the job and wouldn't buckle to the dem you know to the country and chose demagogue over country but yes love to hear your opinion on that so i i just saw a, a clip of her there's there's apparently been an edit to her book which is being released in a, a, a few days time where she specifically claimed to have met kim jong-un right and 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 when she was being pushed on this, she was saying, she, she said, well, when it was pointed out to me, we've made some adjustments, we've, we've made some changes to the text, it's going to be released soon, and blah, blah, blah. But, and and, I, and I, I shared it on Twitter, because it's still called Twitter, we won't call it X. I mean, that's, that's just a stupid idea. But, but I, 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 yeah, exactly. Um, I, I, I shared it, and, and I said, like, what... When when somebody lies to you, they are insulting your intelligence. Why do you keep voting for people like that? Why do you elect people like that who insult your intelligence? And you know, I mean, Trump Trump himself is at the stage now where he's he's exhibiting signs of of, of dementia, signs in not just blurting out whatever comes to his mind because because he he simply cannot restrain himself. But also physical signs of, of of dementia as well, like the falling asleep and the farting in the courtroom and 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 all the rest of it. But but Trump, when when he was in office, and sadly he was actually in office, but but he told something like I think it was seventy thousand lies that were documented over a four year period. And yet there are many people, many people who who think that it's great to have him back. So so. My my advice would be, I mean, first of all, there is an objective reality. That that's that's the first thing. There are there are things that are true and there are things that are not true. And and those people who lie to you, whether it's Trump, whether it's the 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 dog killer, whether it's Carlson or Alex Jones or whatever, they should they should be shunned from decent society. Like who the yes. fuck do you think you are? Yes. How how dare you treat people like that? Yes. Yes, it's so it's so brilliant and it's interesting because when it does happen, when somebody like Marjorie Taylor Greene goes to a restaurant and is shunned or Lauren Boebert is shunned, then they do the fascist victimhood routine. So it's very yeah. interesting because when when, culture. when society does rise up and say this will not stand, uh, you are not fit for purpose, and they have to face the consequences for what they say. They immediately get into the victimhood routine, which works pretty well for their cult. But yeah, I I feel like if we are not more uh, vigilant about calling out uh, these people who are trying to create a false reality, then we may end up being stuck with one and um, being living living in a state where you don't know what's real, you don't know who you can trust. And again, my friend, this is a friend who worked on two Navalny campaigns. He said that people in Russia walk around like they're already in prison. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that is something I understand because we are we are like a decade into what Carol Cadwallader calls a great uh, information war. And yeah. we here in America, still aren't addressing it in any way that's meaningful. Uh, and our podcast, we are as loud as we can possibly be. 
Um, and we know we have an impact because our podcast partner, Jim Stewartson, is being sued by Mike Flynn for $50 million. Uh, and that's because uh, that's to send a message to try to silence those who are bringing the truth. And and I just, I, I don't want this, this horrible, negative, dystopian future. Uh, I don't want it. And I want to fight it now. And I, that's why we keep going back to Ukraine and, and platforming people like you, because we want to let people know that, you know, we have a choice in this moment and, and we have to choose wisely. And that's supporting Ukraine in uh, defense of everyone's uh, human rights. That's, I don't, I don't know how else to put it. So the, the the point about people in Russia walking around as if they're already in prison, men mentally they are. Mentally they are. There, 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 there is no uh, information sphere that has been allowed to continue to exist there that, that, that challenges what the Kremlin wants to put out there, whether, whether, it's, whether it's opposition politicians like Boris Nemtsov being killed, whether it's anti-corruption campaigners like uh, Alexei Navalny being killed, whether it's, you know, Ilya Yashin being put in prison. The, 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 there is no opposition voice. You, I, I remember reading about TV Dorscht and and how when they were they were gaining uh, viewership, um, one of the things that happened was that the, the cable TV providers across Russia that were carrying this channel and and you know saying okay so here is a news channel there's nothing wrong with that right but the cable the cable providers dropped them all and then the next thing that happened was uh the the uh owners of the office space that they rented for their their headquarters uh all of a sudden decided that there were technical problems with the building and they were going to terminate the lease right and and then the next thing was that all of their advertising revenue was being choked off and and everything else like that there there is the, the systematic shutdown of of anything that is opposition related, be it media, be it political sphere, be it be it be it dis, the the descent of the common man or woman on the street or child on the street, uh, uh, you know, a, against what is going on in that in that country. I mean, that that that's I I think there've been. It, and, and it's a truly pathetic figure if you put it in perspective that this is a nation of 144 million people. But there's been something like 19,400 uh, prosecutions in Russia since the beginning of the, the full scale invasion uh, for discrediting the army. Right. A, a, anybody who says anything and you know, going back to the old Soviet tactics of, of denouncing each other and reporting a, a, on each other and, 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 and that kind of stuff. But. And anybody who says anything is, yeah, they are literally imprisoned. And so they're metaphorically, mentally imprisoned as they as they go around now. But, yeah, I think with with, with Mike Flynn and I, I watched there's a, a documentary about his religious crusade that, that, that he's holy on. Holy War. Mike Flynn's the holy, holy War. Yeah, the, the, the Holy War. And, you know, I mean, if, if you're going to convince people of uh, a, a false narrative then you, you can you can start with people who are already believing in fairy tales right mm -hmm. i i don't want to insult anybody's religious beliefs i we I'm, understand. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a non-believer but you know that that would be the well that you would go to to drink in first of all and and that's that's precisely precisely what he's done but but what they're doing isn't like a a a a, a part of Christianity, it is it is Christo fascism. Yeah. It, it is their intention to use the extremes of a, a, a particular religious group within the United States to to further a fascist uh, uh, agenda in in the United States of America. And it's it, it's truly shocking to see the extent to which some people are ready to buy into it, but that also leads back into what you've just said about the victimhood uh, piece as well, right? The, you know, Christians always like to put it out there that they're being persecuted. It's a, it's a central part of their identity. So it's it's an easy fallback for them to say, poor me, I'm being persecuted, and it's because of my faith, it's because of my opinion, it's because of this. As Hi-Fi just said, it's cancel culture, it's, it's whatever it is, yeah? Help, I'm being oppressed. Thank <laughs> you.
Um, <laughs> it's so interesting to hear you say that again. I'm so grateful for your observations from Ukraine about what's happening in America, much like you said when you quoted Timothy Snyder on why don't they call it genocide because then we'd have to do something. It's the same thing with what you described with uh, Mike Flynn's tactic, uh, why we don't have more people reporting on it. Because, you know, A, anybody who reports on it gets sued by Mike Flynn, and B, because then we'd really have to do something about it. And right now, everybody's hiding under the cloak of free speech. And I would say orchestrated mind war is not free speech. And that's what we have been tasked with dealing with uh, here in America that is uh, still going unaddressed. Um, Hi-Fi, you have an important question. Well, I just need to point something out real fast. Uh, you know, Lord Ha Ha during World War II broadcasting Nazi propaganda was treated as, as a traitor, right? Um, instead, we have Tucker Carlson being supported by the Mercers and Musk to broadcast mm -hmm. his, you know, vile propaganda to America. Uh, how do we not see these, the, the, the complicity amongst these players uh, and could in continuing the, the genocide in Ukraine and amplifying, you know, what's going on in Israel and in Gaza. Um, but here's my question to you. I have seen over the last year, a apparently Russian co-opted GOP mm -hmm. stand in the way of aid for Ukraine yeah. for a very long time. Right. Yeah. And finally, and finally, you know, Speaker Johnson gets it. Whatever it was, something worked and we've passed that aid. I, I almost feel like we're standing around patting our backs. Hey, great. We passed aid. But how is it going in, in Ukraine? Is is that aid been deployed? I mean, I I still hear that Russia is moving forward. You're saying it's small villages. OK, true. But still, any any kilometer of territory is a you know, a kilometer that will need to be won back. Is the aid coming? Is it being deployed? What's happening in Ukraine? So uh, let, let me just roll back to the period before the, the, the supplemental was actually passed, right? From, from our perspective, from a Ukrainian perspective, and I mean, it's not just that I live here. I have lived here for 21 years. I stood on on Maidan during you know the orange revolution the revolution of dignity i've got a big ukrainian national patriotic tattoo here i i consider myself to be ukrainian and from our perspective the the delay on aid would, i mean it, frustrating isn't the word right and and I, I i can't even just put a colorful adjective in front of that to make it strong enough this 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 has been a matter of not territory being lost only but of lives being lost it has been a matter of of life and death and i i watched last night um a, a, there's a new documentary on on netflix called the hardest hour and it's it's a two-hour montage of uh ukrainians filming themselves tiktoking themselves you know communicating with friends sending videos to to family whatever it might be and and they've put together two hours of this. And 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 when I when I tweeted about it last night, I said I said, having having watched that, and it was hard to watch, right? Because I mean, the opening period of the full scale war was exceptionally difficult for 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 absolutely everybody. And 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 I and I said then, like, if if you watch that, you have to ask yourself the question: Why was there ever any debate about whether to send tanks and jets to Ukraine? Like with what we've been subjected to. With, with with what has happened to this country at the hands of those barbaric invading bastards, man. Like we we needed everything and we needed it immediately. And and so the the, the period of waiting for the, the the aid package to pass was exceptionally difficult on on the people of Ukraine. And and it went on for half a year as well. Yeah. And and another another piece that I wrote, um, uh, JD Vance, who is in that cohort of of republicans that are anti-ukraine he he did an interview on um state of the union on cnn and i and i watched it 
and then the next day I, I found out the, 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 the interview on YouTube and I transcribed every sentence that he said and debunked every single lie in it. It was full of lies and disinformation. And, you know, the, the, the arguments that people make for not aiding Ukraine, that, that you know, Zelensky is buying mansions or yachts or whatever. Ukraine is a corrupt country. Come on. Seriously. Russia is the corrupt country. I, I do, do need to. I do need to point out that J.D. Vance is only in office in Ohio uh, because of financial and uh, other support from one Peter of our, her, uh, yeah, our oligarch, Peter Thiel. And, and uh, so he just parrots, he's, he's, a, I, I call him a Peter Thiel replicant. He just parrots whatever, you know, he's instructed to parrot. He's programmed to lie like that. And again, what you just described are narratives that some people believe because they listen to somebody who they believe is a senator tell them these things. And, you know, we know that playing whack-a-mole with lies has not been effective. Mm -hmm. what's, what's effective, I think, is what you just said and figuring out a way, since America is so bad at dealing with actual treason, maybe it's literally shunning these people into not wanting to do this type of propaganda anymore. Uh, you know, a lot of them do it because of mice. It's money, ideology, compromat, ego. Uh, but it's um, it's infecting the country that I love. And uh, I'm doing everything I can to try to come up with clever ways to make it stop. And, um, you know, so, you're living, so yes. Let, let let me quote you back to you, Heidi. About five minutes ago, you used three words in sequence, orchestrated mind control. And orchestrated is is a, a key element of that. It, it is orchestrated. And the, the, the former um, chess grandmaster, Gary Kasparov, wrote recently that he, he said, you know, he said, it, it, and, and I guess it's, you know, a bunch of different scientists in different labs doing similar experiments and, you know, arriving at the same conclusion. He, he said, he said it's, it's perfectly reasonable for various independent people to arrive at the same correct conclusion. It is not possible. It is not possible for various individuals to arrive at exactly the same lie. There, there is no coincidence in this. This, oh, is, wow. this, this is most certainly orchestrated, uh, it, it, exactly as you said, and 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 that's that's why, you know, we. I mean, I I became a journalist to fight back against these lies a, a, a decade ago when the initial invasion of of Ukraine began. I, I remember being horrified during the Revolution of Dignity that that we were like the people who were participants. Were, were being called right wing extremists and Nazis, and I and I'm like that's not at all what is happening on Maidan. These are ordinary, as it is in in Georgia right now as well. These are ordinary men and men and women of all different backgrounds, of all different ages, that have all come together at one point and said, "Fuck it, enough, enough," and and that's what happened on the Maidan. But then. You know, the, 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 the end of the revolution was the 22nd of February when, when Yanukovych took exile in, in Russia. And, and it was the 27th of February that the military operation to, to first of all, take Crimea's parliament building and, and then you surround the Ukrainian bases and take over the broadcasting infrastructure in Crimea. I mean, it, it, it all unfolded very, very quickly. But, but then a few weeks later, when they're organizing their referendum, this whole idea of Nazis in Ukraine came back again. And there were, there, were, there were billboards around Crimea with the outline of the peninsula, barbed wire across it, and a swastika in the middle. And it said, 16th of May, this is this is your choice. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's absurd. And the reality is, is that actually Ukrainians are, as again, Tim Snyder said to, to Marjorie Taylor Greene in a co congressional hearing last, last week, it, the, 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 um, there's no popular support for any kind of far right or extremist group they've the, n none of them have ever made the threshold to get representation in parliament the ukrainian people just don't vote for them because we're not nazis yes it's, i know it's ludicrous it's it's ludicrous but then some people buy that there's some utility though in there again my friend who worked with navalny on multiple campaigns said that there's some utility in Putin 
always uh, pointing the finger about fascism and Nazis when he, in fact, is a fascist. Yeah. So there's something there. There's something there. Obviously, he's hearkening back to World War II and defeating fascism. That's, you know, the flag he's trying to wave. But he himself is a fascist. So I don't know what we can do with that type of messaging, whether it's some sort of internal self-loathing, but there's some there's some kind of utility there. And again, we see this all the time. We deal with a group of, again, propagandist is not a great word. I wish we had something better. We, we deal with those orchestrating the mind war uh, and we, we deal with them projecting. They're always projecting. If they make a film about human trafficking, it's because it's financed by those actually involved in the world of human trafficking. They're always trying to project it over here when in fact it's what they actually are doing themselves in pretty much every single case. And I feel like um, until we're able to get people to, I, I've written about this recently, we have this mental block of American exceptionalism. Like none of this can happen here. It's only happening happening over there. It's happening here and it's happening really fast. And our country is going to see things in the next few months that I think we need to start anticipating when we have an organic reaction to a horrible, you know, war. We have to know that will be infiltrated, just as you were saying, when the people in Ukraine rose up, instead of saying these were people rising up for the dignity of their country, they're called right wingers. I think we just have to get so much better at predicting the type of narrative warfare that we're going to face um, every day leading up to the American election. So, so the first thing that I want to say actually is that I do think that America is an exceptional country. I, I love the United States. I've been a, a, a guest in your country many, many times. I've been from Seattle to New York, Washington, D.C., Florida, Arizona. I mean, I've, I've traveled extensively across the United States of America, and I really do love your country. Um, I, I, I'm talking about the, the, the polarization when it, when it comes to the next challenge, the, the next war. When, when, when Hamas went on the, the, the rampage on October the 7th, I, I made a decision then that I was going. I was absolutely going to stay right out of this discussion, not because I I I, I don't see the the images of the destruction of Gaza or the you know Israeli women taken from the 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 the, the, the music festival and and the horrors that they've been subjected to. One of the reasons why I I, I, I my my social media output is very focused on ukraine anyway obviously that is that is you know for, for for me this is where i am this is this is my subject but 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 another reason was that i knew i knew that people were going to get so polarized over this and 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 again it's this orchestrated mind fuck that is going on where you know people can have an opinion whether they are pro israel or, or pro palestine but but it was going to get uh, magnified to massive extents, and you know, I was I was watching Fareed Zakaria earlier on 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 CNN, and and he had an an Egyptian former diplomat and an American Israeli who are both um, lecturers. They they lecture a course together at Dartmouth College, and and they were they were talking about the the uh, campus protests and what it means and how to interpret them and all the rest of it, and and so you know, watching that, I got. A, a, a balanced perspective of, of of what has been going on, but but the online world, it's you know you are in one camp or another, and and it's just got increasingly increasingly hardened and hardened and hardened, and again this is this is the result of deliberate manipulation of of of, of the way that people are, de deliberate manipulation of narratives yes but deliberate manipulation of, of the way that people are thinking as well and it you know it's the it's the wedge that they've been uh, uh driving further in they they will see any uh differences not not even divisions but differences in society and they'll go there's one to exploit and they keep banging and banging and banging until they've driven the two parts further well, aside so they're at the point of, of conflict with each other and can, i mean can i just point something out 
Can I just yeah. point something out? <clears throat> the Israeli-Palestinian protest conflict that is occurring today. Now, I know Americans have no long-term memory, but I would just like to point out that in 2020, what we had was the Proud Boy versus Antifa versus BLM. You know, we had the Oath Keepers out there and the country was going to burn. It was burning. The cities were on fire. Um, now we're seeing, you know, the these Democrat-led liberal universities all support Hamas and they're funded by Soros. And, and it's just, it's the same ridiculous bullshit over and over and over. And I don't understand why do you think people can't see it? Well, no. uh, like, are we just, we lack that much memory? We can't follow a narrative for more than it, it a requires. Week? It requires a zoom out. But here's how Paul Conroy, our mutual friend, Paul Conroy, explained yeah. it. Okay. As a war correspondent, Paul Conroy would, you know, they'd have the opportunity with his images and uh, various reporters that he teams up with to do something on Sunday that was meaningful. So when people opened the newspaper and learned about something about war, they could get some meaningful information and, and empathetic information. And he described social media as, you know, we're going to show you some war porn, some trauma porn. He probably didn't use that word. I'm using it. And now you have to decide. You've got to make your decision, you know, in or out. Whose side are you on? And mm -hmm. what that has meant I can tell you right now in America in 2024 is we are being marched toward fascism, okay? People's empathy is being are being weaponized to march us toward fascism. People who would have maybe been able to look at Biden and some of the good that he's done, particularly me focusing on the environment to see some of the good he's done, now are being pushed away from Joe Biden, which does one thing, which marches us toward fascism. So when you say hi-fi, why can't they see it? It's it's designed to make sure that they don't see it. It's designed to say, in or out, what side are you on? That's it. And unfortunately, I'm watching a lot of people who were progressives say, I'm sorry, but I just can't vote for Biden, which means one thing, fucking fascism. When the far right and the far left are both using the same phrase, genocide Joe. Okay, first, they're minimizing the actual genocide going on in Ukraine, right? Uh, one can argue that you know Netanyahu's Likud government has carried out war crimes in Palestine, right? Okay. Um, yeah. It just, to, to blame Joe Biden for these failings to obfuscate what's going on from both sides should tell you this far right, far left bullshit is exactly that bullshit. All mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not the greatest fan of Joe. He's doing some good. I, I just don't like politicians in general, I think. But anyway, if you don't vote Biden, you're voting for the fascist gas bag. Who yeah. is Putin's little toy? Yeah, I don't want to walk around America like I'm already in prison. I, I the, the, there's, there's a great uh, reporter on CNN, the Irish chap, Donny, Donny, Donny. I forget his I forget his surname now, but but he he's often talking to Trump supporters at, at rallies, and I, I he asked one recently, like you know, if the, if the election were tomorrow and the choice is Vladimir Putin or Joe Biden, who do, who do you vote for? And and the woman says. Well, Vladimir Putin I couldn't. I couldn't vote for Joe Biden. Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, you know, the yeah. the, the narrative, the narrative that he is wow. old. Yes, he is. We we know he's old, but therefore that that means that he is senile, incapable. That that is directly uh, counter to the evidence that we have of what he's done during mm -hmm. his presidency. He got he got you know the infrastructure passed. He, you know, he's like it or not, and I, I see a lot of people supporting it, but, 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 you know, helping families get out of debt with the, mm. you know, the student debt relief, the, 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 the jobs numbers again, the jobs numbers just came out. I think it was today and or, or yesterday, and again, it's a staggering, staggering growth in, in, you know, the, the, the 
the, the number of people who are gainfully employed in the United States of America. By, by any metric, mm -hmm. Joe Biden's presidency, yes, he might be a little bit slow when he's speaking, but he's, you know, for, for his entire life had a, a, a stammer to deal with. Mm -hmm. You know, he, by every metric, his presidency is a success. But conversely, conversely, what did Trump do or what did the Republicans do with Trump in the White House in four years? They passed tax cuts for billionaires. And that was it. And put and put extremist judges on our Supreme Court. So those yes. were the two successes, the tax cuts for billionaires, the, the Supremes. Uh, one thing I'd like to add about Joe Biden is that he has done more for environmental protections mm -hmm. and for climate justice than any president in American history. And he right now is trying to save the North Atlantic right whale. There are only 360 left. He's now committed to trying to make sure that the North Atlantic uh, right whale does not go extinct. And like that matters to me. I care about whales. If you look at Trump's legacy, it was rolling back regulations, rolling back environmental protections, marching us uh, toward not only a fascist hellscape, but an unlivable earth. And it's like there, there it's not there's no both sides. You know, but what you just said was very important about the choice between Biden and Putin. You vote for Putin. I understand that because, again, we're talking about orchestrated mind war. They have been dancing around the edges with Russia, and now they are fully, the propagandists are fully uh, delivering Putin and Dugan, you know, to their cult. So it's uh -huh. not surprising. It is not surprising. I, uh, on a on a happier note, Haifa, you touched on this earlier. Whatever it took to get uh, arms to Ukraine and to get that passed, are is there any relief in sight? Are you seeing relief? Is it is it helpful? What do we know? Sorry, yeah, that that was a part of Haifa's question that I, I I didn't get around to. So, logistically speaking. Yeah, you know, I mean, okay. The 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 bill is almost sixty one billion dollars. It's not sixty one billion that all comes in at once. It's it's going to be spaced out in tranches over months and months and months. It will be the amount of ammunition that we can physically receive into the country, distribute through the logistics networks to get to the front lines, and 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 so on and so on. But but we're talking about tens, hundreds of tons of heavy equipment. And and that kind of stuff just doesn't get moved straight away. So um, we, we inertia, we, yeah, yeah, it 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 takes time. The the there was talk of uh, an immediate surge because there was there was stuff that was lined up in Poland and in Germany that was that was ready to be immediately shipped into into Ukraine. We we've had here a, a national reserve, a, a stockpile of ammunition that was being rationed and knowing now what is coming and when it is going to come in what kind of quantities it means that we've been unable to uh loosen up the the grip on on some of the national stockpiles and so the the, the situation is not as bad as it has been but we are still and again it's important to point out that this is entirely artificial mm -hmm. we are still in a situation where we we have a uh what, what's called a, a shell famine we have a, we 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 do not have sufficient resources to be able to respond in kind to the kind of artillery barrages that are that are coming from russia but but in terms of russian capabilities here's another thing that's very important to note as well you know they one of one of the tactics that they adopted sometime into this war was was buying these drones from iran now they've also got you know domestic manufacturing uh, capability for those things as well. But we Ukraine has hit them with our long range drone since. But then then Russia took huge quantities in violation of UN sanctions, by the way. But Russia took huge quantities of of ammunition from North Korea, right? And so you know, it, it, talking about the Russian war machine, they have been exposed to uh, be be nothing like. Uh, as 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 people had assumed for for many many years, there there is uh, increased production of things like 155 millimeter shells. Um, Scranton is now up to I think 36,000 units uh, per month, and and so what will happen 
is that over the over the coming weeks, more of this stuff is going to be shipped to Ukraine. The, the new stuff that's being produced is going to replenish your U.S. stockpiles, which, again, the money of U.S. aid to Ukraine isn't cash that comes to Ukraine. It, it gets invested in the United States of America. It boosts your economy. It employs people in your country, right? Can, but, you, can you just say that one more time? It employs people in your country. It boosts your economy. Thank you. <laughs> I feel like Teletubbies, one more time. Like maybe if they hear it again, they'll understand. Um, is, that the, is that the sound bite that you advertise this podcast with now? <laughs> uh, yes, exactly. Uh, there's so many choices. Um, so that's very, 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 very important. And, uh, you know, we are here just doing everything we can in our small but mighty way to um, to be helpful because we realize just how incredibly important this is. Uh, this fight is for everybody who cares about democracy. And having a democracy right next to you for Putin is not a good look because he's trying to do everything in his power to make it look like democracies are failing, which mm -hmm. is again, part of that false reality that he, uh, that he orchestrates. Um, I think it's very important to remind our viewers uh, what you saw 10 years ago that inspired you to create Lifeline Ukraine, remind our viewers what it's about and anything that we can do to help. Because I realize in, in a time of war, the funding for very important things often, uh, you know, uh, gets lost or taken away. And what can we do to help? So anything you can tell us. So, so first of all, uh, just to touch on the point that you made about the fight for democracy, I, I wrote a piece again for Byline Times why the Putin regime is existentially threatened by, uh, by by Ukraine. And I argued there are two things. Ukraine is is a democracy. It is a, it is a democracy where we do not know who, you know, the, there's no preordained outcome to elections as we've just seen in, in, in Russia with this pretend presidential farce that they, they went through. So one thing that threatens the Putin regime, not Russia itself, but the Putin regime, because they, they are distinctly different things, is Ukraine's example of democracy. The other thing that threatens the Putin regime is, uh, is, is Ukraine's successful fight against corruption. And we, we've been doing that for a decade. We've been, we've been finding spaces where corrupt practices have existed and we've been shutting them down. And we've been doing it relentlessly since the revolution of, uh, of dignity. And that piece that I wrote for Byline Times was published on the 27th of January, of 2022, so less than a month before the invasion came. We knew it was coming, and I wanted to explain up front what the real reasons were. Um, in, with Lifeline Ukraine, um, it, it hasn't been operational for 10 years. It's been operational for four and a half years. Um, and I, I did it. I was asked to um, by the, the, the then acting Minister of Health. Um, I, I, I went into the Ministry of Health and and, and took a meeting that that made me understand the importance of this project for the country. Um, and first and foremost, our our mission in actual fact, and the, I, I know it's a big, uh, 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 important topic in the United States as well, is 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 we we intended to prevent veteran suicides. And you know, you had this big movement movement of twenty two push ups for twenty two days. The reason for those numbers, 22-22, was because at one point the United States was losing 22 veterans to suicide every single day, every single day. And, and we've been seeing it here as well amongst the veteran community because experiences of war are not, 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 just, not just deeply traumatic, but, but horrific. The, the, you know, war, war is hell. War, war, is, war is the nastiest, nastiest thing. Um, since the, the, the full-scale invasion, we, we've gone from averaging providing a 1,000 instances of support every month um, uh, prior to February 2022 to January and February of 2024 uh, providing 6,500 instances of support per month. So the, the surge in demand for... Um, support from Lifeline Ukraine re reflects the, 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 the emotional toll, the psychological toll um, that this war is, is having on all of us. 
but it's not just the increase in numbers it's it's the the changes in the nature of the calls that that we've had to prepare to take as well so i i did a series of training sessions with my colleagues in the second half of 2022 one of the topics that we had to um consider was was how do we support people who've been victims of these brutal gang rapes that the the the, the russians are infamous for that they you know that they do everywhere we also learn how we support people who have been displaced by war because e each individual uh, uh, person who has lost all of their familiarity, their surroundings, their possessions, their, 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 their friends, their home, you know, each individual uh, is, is struggling to process that. But then the size of the problem is that we have 7 million internally displaced people and 4 million Ukrainians who are refugees in, in third countries as well. The last... Um, I mean, you mentioned our fr our friends Paul Conroy and and Zarina and and John Sweeney. They they made a film in in which they they took a guy called Sasha back to the the the, the prison cell where he'd been tortured in in Kherson city, which has now been liberated, obviously. And and the guy just started to cry. And when I watched that film, I realized that that was something that. We, we would also encounter, and, and so that's a training course that we've recently done as well, how, how we support people who are um, victims of, of, of torture in, in, in Russian captivity. Um, sadly, the situation for Lifeline Ukraine for the last month is that our work has been paused. As, as you said, you know, in war, there are always people talking about different priorities. Um, and and uh, we, we, we came to a point where we just did not have the money that we need to 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 meet our operational costs and so and so at the beginning of april we we had to push the pause button i, I have i have colleagues that volunteer a couple of hours every evening um uh, because those are the most critical times when when the the the, the most intense calls are coming through that's what that's when people who are um dealing with black moments that that that's when they're most likely to experience it and and so we have a small uh, uh, volunteer uh, operation that is that is ongoing, but we we need to get back to to being funded. And so um, our website is lifelineukraine.com. It, it couldn't be easier. There is there is a button which is marked donate. There's there's a there's a flag if it's in the wrong language, but it should automatically open up in your regular language that that, that your browser is set to. Um, and there's, there's a button that, that's marked donate and, and people can subscribe and uh, contribute on a monthly basis through Patreon. They can send us uh, payments with, with a credit card. They can send us PayPal. Um, our bank account details are on there as well. So any any kind of support that will help us get back to being able to properly meet the, 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 the needs, the psychological needs and, and address the emotional crises that are going on here, we would be very, 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 very grateful for. Thank you so much for that, Paul. Thank you for everything you do. And we will also reach out to some of our friends who might be in touch with uh, more high level, uh, you know, uh, organizations that might be able to do something um, at a greater, you know, uh, greater level in order to keep you guys going and uh, doing your very important work. Um, that's all. That's all I got. That's all the questions that I had. I'm going to have to go deal with my emotions now. <laughs> The hard, hardest part of this job is what to do with all these feelings that come up from these incredible interviews. Hi-Fi, anything else from you? I just, I have a favor to ask, Paul. Uh, yeah. If you happen to run into Budinov, ask him if he's hiring, because, you know, I'm I'm always down. So. <laughs> I I uh, have, have not had the pleasure of meeting him yet, um, but believe me, uh, if ever if ever that comes to pass, I, I'm going to be giving that man a, a, a high five. What what he does is is exceptional, and I'll certainly mention to him your interest in coming over here and working in Ukraine. <laughs> I, it, no one causes chaos quite like I do. So <laughs> that is very true. Chaos for good, I should say. Um, okay, let, let let me let me just say one one final thing before you you round out. Let's let's not wait another year before we do this again. Yeah. So so yes, today. let's do this more regularly, at least uh, once a month or every couple of months and just stay well and 
thank you so much for all the good work that you do and for bringing us this really important information straight from Kiev. It's it's uh, been my pleasure, and uh, I very much enjoyed our conversation. Look forward to the next time. Thank you. Thank you.